Psalm 119 and verses 57 through to 64. As we continue in this series that makes the points of each sermon to be uh, declarations of intent or um, decisions of volition to decide to do something, I will do something. So we are structuring the each sermon um, using this scripture and making exegetical application out of each sermon point. So Psalm 119, 57 to 64, let's read and pray and then I'll begin. The Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. I entreat your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. When I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. Though the cords of the wicked ensnare me, I do not forget your law. At midnight I rise to praise you because of your righteous rules. I'm a companion of all who fear you, of those who keep your precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, please will you help us again in the study of your word and and use this time to plow into our hearts and to cut them open and to sow your seed, the seed of your word deeply therein so that it might bring forth a, a harvest of righteousness and the fruit of repentance. And how appropriately, Lord, that this should take place as we come to your table after the service. So even during this sermon, we ask you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would please, in his gracious and particular manner, uh, work and prick at our consciences and and cut into our our thoughts and rein in those distractions so that we would hear what it is being said and that we would respond as we should with faith and repentance through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the most penetrating statements that I've ever heard outside of Scripture that is to say, this is not the Word of God, what I'm going to say, but it certainly reflects some truths from the Word of God. But it came from one uh, Rolf Waldo Emerson. And in that language of sowing and reaping, he said simply and hauntingly and with tragic irony, because he did not seem to be a Christian, he said, sow a thought and reap an action. Sow an act and reap a habit. Sow a habit, and you reap a character. Sow a character, and you reap a destiny. The law of cause and effect realized in spiritual matters that stretch ultimately into eternity from thought to act to habit to character to destiny. And so, Speaking now to Christians, for the most part in this room, and though perhaps some who are not, having been saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are a Christian, it is certainly worth attending those things which make for godly thoughts and lead to godly actions, to establish godly habits, to form a godly character, so that our faith is shown to be real and true and not bogus, so that we might be useful in the Lord's service in this world, and so as to store up treasures in heaven. This is why I've called the sermon, the sermon this, this evening, God's Word and Godly Habits for the South African Christian. My first point is this. I will value the invaluable God in my materialistic culture, verse 7. You know, it's so easy to overlook that little line there, the Lord is my portion in the first verse. 
You know, if you were an ancient Hebrew, it would immediately bring to mind the time of, of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, that wilderness generation in preparation for the invasion of the promised land. Each tribe was told that they would be allocated a portion of land there and a number of cities appropriate to the size of the tribe. But one tribe had excelled in its service beyond all the others. And one family had been earmarked for a privileged position before all the others. During that terrible rebellion where Israel worshipped the golden, the golden calf, the statue of the golden calf, the tribe of Levi rallied to Moses and struck down thousands of idolaters. They remained faithful to the Lord and were to be re rewarded as a result. And though Aaron himself had been somewhat complicit in all of this, the Lord did not reject him, but out of sheer grace kept him and his children as the high priestly family for, for the ages that were to come. But listen how it is that the Lord bestows these honors upon the Levites and upon the family of Aaron. To the Levites, he said in Exodus 32, Moses said, Today you have been ordained for the service uh, to, of the Lord. And then in Deuteronomy 10, clarifying what that means, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister him to him, and to bless his name to this day. Therefore, Levi has no portion or inheritance with his brothers. The Lord is his inheritance, as the Lord your God said to him. In other words, Levi doesn't get land. Levi gets the Lord. The portion for Levi is the Lord. And Numbers 18, the Lord said to Aaron and his family, You shall have no inheritance in their land, neither shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the people of Israel. Aaron gets to be serving the Lord in that nearest, most intimate of places, within the Holy of Holies, uh, within uh, the temple and tabernacle. And now as it is, David is bringing this to mind and he's borrowing that language. He's calling it to mind. Remember who he is. He is a, a, a powerful king, a wealthy king. He's got treasures, he's got armies, he's got palaces, he's got land. He can command his heart's desire. He can fulfill his every wish, his every craving, such as his, his authority. But he says, I would trade it all in an instant for the inestimable value, value of having the Lord God as my portion. The Lord is my portion. Never mind all this other stuff that I have. I'm thankful for it, but the Lord is my portion. He, more than all of this, all that I own, all else that I could achieve, all else that I could purchase, all else that I could long for, He, God, my God, this almighty, living, personal deity that is Jehovah, Jesus Christ. I wonder if there's a, a lesson for, that, for, for us in that. I, I bet there is. That though invitations to worldliness have always been around since Adam and Eve first rebelled against God, I would say that our own time has furnished us with an astounding array of opportunities to become greedy, ambitious, discontent, covetous, and all-round materialistic. Now, we, we are indoctrinated day and night by advertising, by Hollywood, with pictures, with suggestions of what it would be like to be rich, to have this, to have that, to go here, to go there, and encouraged to inspire to have more of it and not to be happy until you've got it. We are actively targeted by marketing gurus whose sole purpose in life, whose sole job is to make you dissatisfied with what you have and to go out and buy something which you, we are told is the secret to your happiness. And they don't really have to try very hard because our hearts are predisposed towards comfort and desire and, and even, I would say, towards idolatry in a sense, to find happiness in the wrong thing. And so with a click of a button for your convenience and the swiping of a screen, you can see merchandise from every single corner of the globe. You can add it to your shopping basket. You can click pay, purchase, and you can have it delivered overnight to your doorstep. I mean, hasn't, hasn't this become our culture? And aren't a great many of the problems in our society because of incessant greed, 
and discontent with, with what God has given us for, uh, for, by, by not having what others have. Now, now, I'm not suggesting, in case you're thinking this, that there's anything inherently sinful with internet shopping or with economic progress, personally or as a society, of course not. What I'm warning of is the potential it all has to draw out that covetous, materialistic, worldly spirit that every one of us must resist as those who are in Christ and who must seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. You must, I must, be careful not to lose sight of this greater portion, superior to all the wares of the world, to have Christ, to seek Christ, to know Christ. This is our privilege as believers. To say with David, the Lord is my portion, he above all else, he before all else. And though David, and though you, and though I, we will repeatedly fall short in our high aspirations to be uh, more zealous Christians, to seek him more faithfully, we will fall short. I know that, you know that. We must all the same be guarded. We must return and seek to pursue the invaluable God in this materialistic culture. We must enter into this resolve of saying, I promise to keep your words. I promise to remember your words. I promise to believe your promises, O God, that to, to know you, to have you, is greater than life itself. And the more we do that, the more we sow a habit And the more we reap a character, and the more the things of this world go strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. So I will, I will seek, I will, I will value the invaluable God in this materialistic world. Secondly, I will become beggarly in the pursuit of His grace. Look at verse fifty-eight. Any serious consideration of God. Any that is sincere and true and founded upon God's word and not man's own ideas will result in the cry of verse 58. It will result in an appeal for God's favor and God's grace. If that has not been your experience, let me say this quickly, if you have never been brought to the place of calling on the Lord for grace and mercy on the basis of His promises through Jesus Christ, then you do not know God and you are not saved and you will not come into his peace in heaven. And you're still in your sins and you will be condemned. You see, the message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ dying for sinners and being raised on the third day and the salvation that comes to those who will trust in him for this, that good news presumes that the one believing it has a sense of their need for it a personal yearning uh, to be forgiven, a a desire to be reconciled with this almighty God, my creator, uh, and a personal uh, awareness and understanding that that I'm sinful and I I need grace. It's not some cold, remote transaction whereby someone grows up in a church and acknowledges a string of facts and eventually signs on the dotted line and dates it, checking all the right boxes and then declares himself to be a Christian. I mean, I grew up like that. And when I was truly converted much later, I knew what terrible danger I'd been in all those years sitting in church. Now, the the gospel, when it is truly understood and believed and trusted, it causes a person to feel their need for salvation and to long for the grace that is offered through Jesus Christ. To, To borrow the words of this verse, there is heart to it. There is appeal to it. And though you or I may not be able to pinpoint the moment that heart or appeal was made, um, though we may not have a day or a specific time or event where we can pinpoint that, that this was the moment that I was saved, somewhere along the path of that gradual understanding from childhood or even as an adult, you will have stopped thinking of God and the gospel as merely a concept to be understood, 
and you would have looked with faith upon the cross where Jesus died as a sacrifice for sin and you would have cried out, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then you would have looked at your life and you would have begun to pray, be gracious to me, O Lord. Be gracious to me. Help me to honor and obey you in my imperfect repentance. That's what the psalmist does here. Having considered the, the goodness of God and the godness of God, he resolves that he will entreat, seek, plead, beg for his favor. He, he doesn't come arrogantly like the name it and claim it crowd, making demands of God. Just name it, claim it, God will give it. He isn't treating the Lord like some sort of glorified genie in the bottle who you must butter up with compliments to get what he wants out of him. He isn't taking the route of many churches in South Africa, quite frankly. Most churches. Haven't you seen some of them? Well, what do you hear when you go there? You don't hear, Lord, make me holy. Lord, make me humble. Lord, show me my sins so that I might repent of it. Lord, teach me patience. Lord, change my heart so that I should love you as I should. You don't hear that there. No, what you hear instead is, Lord, make me rich. Lord, make me successful. Lord, break down the barriers stopping my success. Lord, give me miracles and power. Uh, but you don't see that here in the psalm. He comes as a beggar, he comes as a pauper, pleading for grace to know and live before this holy and awesome God. He's not even fixated on possessions of any kind, but just on knowing God and His grace. The word translated favor here, I entreat your favor, is also elsewhere translated your face. I entreat I I entreat your face with all my heart. Can, can you hear it? He just longs to know God. This God who has everything in his hands. This God who can kill and make alive. This God who can cast body and soul into hell or raise them up to heaven. This God who is a consuming fire. This God who is awesome. His greatness is above the heavens. He looks far down on his creation. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and the ends of the earth are his possession. This God, I will seek the face of such a God as he. I will entreat his favor. I will call for his grace. His word is spoken, and I believe it. He has promised mercy and help and comfort and counsel and guidance for those who will humble themselves before it. And here I come, ready to receive his answer. Whatever he may decide, whatever he may or may not give, I know my sins. It is plain to me that I need His grace because there is nothing else to which I might appeal, nothing in my life worth mentioning. And so I come in the name of His own Son. And I come and I entreat Him with all my heart. I appeal to Him both for my salvation and for the entirety of my life because apart from Him, I can do nothing. That's the attitude of David here, beggarly in his pursuit of God and his grace. Thirdly, I will be punctual in my repentance. Think, obey, and not delay. I couldn't resist. I had a look online this week to see where different countries fall in the matter of punctuality or pro procrastination. It was interesting to hear the different approaches of different cultures to something as simple as just getting somewhere by an agreed upon time. Assuming this is correct, I don't know for sure, but apparently in South Korea to arrive late is a sign of disrespect and in Japan one minute late is considered late. In China, you can arrive up to 10 minutes late, but not actually be considered late. But in Germany, you're expected to arrive 10 minutes early, or else you are late. In Mexico, it's not uncommon for people to arrive 30 minutes late for a meeting. In Brazil, you're not required to be on time unless you use the phrase English time, which means be punctual. 
In Nigeria, a meeting scheduled for 1 p.m. can start any time between 1 and 2. In Ghana, even if a time is given, it could mean any time during the day. And in Greece, foreigners are expected to be punctual, but not locals. But for social meetings, you're expected to be 30 minutes late. And so on. You, you see the diversity in approaches to, to, to time, to uh, punctuality, and, and procrastination, and so on. Now, now, I mention this to illustrate how uh, different people and cultures and countries and nations and so on um, view these things. The problem, however is that sometimes those cultural or national norms leak into spiritual duties as well, as they would here in South Africa as much as anywhere else. Our culture, generally speaking, is one that lacks punctuality and procrastinates about a whole bunch of things and cannot be trusted to keep its word. Proof text, I can't give you one, but proof example, I'll call you back. Ever heard that? And we feel it in the church, and I'm not talking about the fact that some people are always late for church and they miss an important part of the gathered worship of God's people and they disrupt it for other people who are already there. I'm not talking about that. That's an issue, but that's not my point. I'm, I'm not talking either about the occasional forgetfulness or unplanned uh, circumstances that interrupt our otherwise punctuality or so on. I'm talking about something far more important. I'm talking about repentance about obedience to the revealed will of God and the alarming laxity, the lazy indifference to the clear commanding words of Scripture. And so Christians hear the word of God and they say, oh gee, the Bible says that, I'll have to get around to doing that sometime. Or, you know, the preacher made a good point today. I'll, I think I'll put that on the to-do list. Or the most common of all, yeah, yeah, I'll get to that tomorrow. No, not today, uh, tomorrow, and then what usually happens? Nothing. But look at the attitude of the psalmist here. To every sermon, to every study, to every devotional time in the Bible, to every moment of spiritual self-awareness and self-examination, when I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies, I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. He says as a, as a negative, I do not delay, and he says as a positive, I hasten. I think upon my life, its ways, its outcome, its habits, its patterns, and I reorientate it towards God's path, to his testimonies, and I take urgent action, immediate action. I rush, I go swiftly, I act at once to align my waywardness to the truth of God's word. Now, can you imagine if every Christian in our country did this every time the Bible was read, spoken, or preached. It would mean reformation. It would mean revival in the church before the world. And there'd be no more procrastination in repentance. There'd no more duties put off again and again and again and again until conscience no longer calls and the conviction that was briefly felt on Sunday fades away. Instead, people would think obey and not delay and the whole culture of procrastination and broken promises to God and man would change and it would change into a culture of immediate submission to God's truth and immediate consideration for one's neighbor imagine what it would be like and some who are not saved even some in the visible church would be pulled back from the path of putting off repentance to tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. They would hear the words of Hebrews declaring loud in threefold repetition, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as, you, as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. And again, today if you hear his voice. And a third time, today if you hear his voice. You know, why, why is it so important today? because we cannot underestimate the danger of putting it off until tomorrow. After all, one of two terrible things might happen before tomorrow comes. Firstly, you might die. 
which if you're not a Christian is a catastrophe beyond the power of description. If you've resisted and delayed and put off and refused God for your whole life and you die, you will be lost. You will be condemned to hell, says the Holy Scriptures, not me, says the Word of God, and you will curse the day that you said, tomorrow. And secondly, the other terrible thing that might happen is that you could be hardened to the voice of God, to the calling of His Spirit, either as an unbeliever because you go on your way less inclined to listen, less ready to hear the next time, or even as a believer, hardened in some course of action that will bring regret and misery and even the discipline of God upon your life if you will not repent. So today, if you hear His voice, tonight, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. If, if you are here and there's something that you have heard in, in the Word of God, in the reading of Scripture, in the um, scriptural-filled prayers that have been spoken or sung, if there's something that God is drawing to your attention somewhere that He's putting His finger upon your life, then think, obey, and do not delay. And so today, an action, and again tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, and so form a habit, and then keep that habit going, and so form a character. Fourth point. I will praise God when a victim of crime verses 61 and 62. And it doesn't take any great knowledge of current affairs to see how this is relevant to our nation. The criminal justice system fails us in many respects, and the institutions in which we are tempted to put our trust are undermanned or underpaid or overwhelmed, and that's before we even get to the issues of corruption or incompetence. So much so that sometimes we don't even think to report crime to the police and we're quicker to call armed response than we are to call 10111. Crime is a part of our lives and often we're not surprised anymore when it happens unless it is particularly close or shocking as it sometimes is. And though we must admit that many of our families, perhaps even most here, are sheltered from the worst of the crime in this nation, it is probably still accurate to say that every person in this room has been uh, the victim, if you choose that term, the victim of some or other criminal action uh, in South Africa. You know, as, as I, just knowing what I do about uh, what I've seen in the life of this church and some of your family members, we've had car had hijackings, we've had attempted home invasions, We've had car and house break-ins. We've had business robberies, even those that included murder and assault. We've had hostage taking. We've had vehicles stolen. The list goes on, and there's probably a whole lot that's been kept secret and unknown to the rest of us as well. What then, amongst other things, is the response of the Christian when a victim of crime? Verse 61. Though the cords of the wicked ensnare me, I do not forget your law. At midnight I rise to praise you because of your righteous rules. The psalmist speaks about a time when he is surrounded, caught, bound, and snared by the wicked. When there are threats to his person, when evil men seem to prevail. Perhaps this is in the context of persecution, we're not told. Perhaps it's in the context of militant invasion. Perhaps it's the plotting and scheming of some adversary in the court. Or perhaps God has just left it broad enough for us intentionally so that we can appropriately apply it to any situation where we have an adversary, someone who is acting against us. But whatever the, the situation is, the point is, is that he will be viewed by modern understanding as the criminal, uh, as, as the victim of some criminal action. And he says, when that inevitably happens, and it will inevitably happen, he has chosen to do something. It's not to surrender to the surging hatred that might easily well up within him, that would be 
indulged in with such satisfaction, hate for a person or a culture or even the establishment which has failed to protect us, that's not his response at all. And it's not to surrender to the understandable fear and anxiety which must surely accompany us when we are violently uh, attacked in our homes, in our places of safety. That that trauma is real, let's not pretend otherwise. And it takes time to subside, to arrest and subdue those feelings before God. And it's not as simple as just throwing your favorite verse at someone who is deeply shaken, of course not. But, uh, but the, the psalmist doesn't immerse himself, though, in this new world of nightmarish fantasy and horror uh, that he now imagines to be surrounding him. Oh no, he does something else. He says, I do not forget your law. He turns to God's word. He makes that to be his pilot, his anchor, his guiding light. Emotionally, he's all over the place. He doesn't trust himself to, to steer the ship. He says, I turn to God's word. God's word must captain my life right now because, quite frankly, my emotions are, are completely compromised at this point. God's word. He turns to what is objectively and absolutely true and he uses it to fight against the subject of what ifs, what ifs that are surging within him. When, when the cords of the wicked, when the coils of the serpent begin to crush him, and they're constricting his heart, they're crushing his chest, and it's, it's so hard to breathe for fear, and that pressure is, is upon him, where does he turn? He turns to the law of God, to the word of God. And what's more, he resolves to actually actively praise God, verse 62. That would seem to be the context and the reference to midnight there. It's not just that he's saying, I randomly woke up at midnight one night and decided to jump out of it and praise God. Now, by all means, do that, and nothing wrong with doing that. But I would suggest to you that in this context, that midnight is being shown as the darkest, most dangerous hour of the night, it's even in some medieval superstitious cultures considered the witching hour because that's when evil seems to have more power in those cultures. So, so consider what the psalmist is thinking in this pre-industrial, pre-electrical society where there is no um, the flick of the switch to bring illumination. Turn this into a story if you like. It's midnight. It's the darkest hour when most honest citizens are asleep and many criminals are stalking the streets under the cover of night, slipping in and out of the shadows. And the psalmist has been a victim of crime in the past. He knows it by first-hand experience. And there he sleeps, but suddenly he jolts awake with a start. Was that a noise he just heard? Was it just a dream? Did I imagine it? Uh, was it just my mind playing tricks on me because of what happened uh, last year? And he listens for a while. And he realizes it was nothing and all is well, but now his heart is beating and he can't get back to sleep. What does he do? He rises to praise God, to focus his heart and his mind on the one who never sleeps and always watches over his children. Or perhaps verse 62 is more of a declaration of holy defiance. As if he's saying, other men wake at midnight to watch over their goods. Others rise to arm themselves and stand guard and watch for the cattle thief, the crook or the hooligan who's going to smash the window. Others rise because of the threat, uh, the, because the threat of criminal action draws them up. Uh, uh, they're reacting to the evil, but not the psalmist. He says he rises because of the worthiness of God. He is drawn out of bed, not because of fear or concern, but because of the goodness and praiseworthy greatness of the Lord. And understand, he's not mocking those who jump out of bed because you hear a bang in the night. We've all done that. We need to be good stewards and men. You need to be the protector of your home, humanly speaking. And this isn't a debate about whether you have armed response or not. By all means, get it if you can. No, the point the psalmist is making is that the criminals aren't going to be the ones to pull his strings. Evil men don't get to master him or his sleep or his responses or his emotions. He won't rise out of imagined fears for the sake of the criminal, but he'll rise for the sake of God. 
you'll not be dissuaded from worshiping God. And there's this great help here. I think there's great wisdom in this. Because if, if I'm focused on my hurts and my loss, if I'm focused on the threat of outside criminal intent, outside evil, then all my thoughts and all my emotions are going to begin to betray me. I'm going to be enslaved to fear or anxiety, uh, to hatred perhaps, or depression. But if I consciously turn to God and His Word in praise and trust and focus on Him and His attributes and His qualities and His doings and dealings and history with His people, then not only am I recognizing that He is in control, and not only do I render to God the appropriate praise that He is due, whatever my circumstances, but I also actually do my own soul good too. And I settle the, the raging waters of my heart. Perhaps this is why Matthew Henry said what he famously did in a quote that I, I love to repeat, and some of you know well, but after having had someone steal from him his wallet, Matthew Henry, the, that great Puritan commentator, he gave four reasons for thankfulness before God, and, and, and he turned it into a prayer. Uh, he said, Lord, let me be thankful first because he never robbed me before. Second, because although he took my wallet, he did not take my life. Third, because although he took all I possessed, it wasn't much. And fourthly, because it was I who was robbed and not I who robbed. I mean, well, what maturity that he can see such praiseworthy qualities to an evil act against him. Not, not praising for the evil, but praising God in the midst of that. You can tell he believes in the sovereignty of God, can't you? you? You can tell he knows exactly who allowed that robbery to take place. It's why Romans 8.28 is such a favorite verse for those who believe and understand it. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. So yes, you could say we are victims of crime in that judicial sense, but we are also constantly the, the object, the, the target of loving providence, of divine sovereignty that is always at work, even over the actions of evil men and women in our land, South Africa. It is always controlling, orchestrating, ordering, and ruling and turns every evil deed to serve some hidden good purpose for those who love the Lord Jesus Christ and have been called through many trials and tribulations according to his wisdom and plan. Finally then, last point before conclusion, I will keep good company and be united with them in, good, in God's purposes. The Apostle Paul once declared in 1 Corinthians, do not be deceived, bad company corrupts good character or bad company ruins good morals. And here is the ancient equivalent of that, stated more positively in verse 23. I am a companion to all who fear you. But notice he, he qualifies who it is that really fears the Lord. Because some people say that they have a reverence for God, a fear for God, a respect for God, and yet they defy Him, um, even though they say that they, they're showing their faith in a different way. But the Bible says you don't have your own way of showing your faith. You have one way of showing that you fear God. How? Second part of verse 63, you keep his precepts. Otherwise, you're just kidding yourself. Those good companions who fear God are the ones who keep his word, who obey his commandments. And if you're not sure about that, and if you're thinking, well, that sounds like legalism because someone once told you that that's legalism, I remind you that love for God and obedience to God are tied together in the Bible. So it's no good saying I show my faith by my love but not by my obedience. That, that's a contradiction. Jesus rejects that assumption. He condemns it to hell. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. 
He says, not all those who say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father. So, so let's not create artificial dilemmas by dividing fear and love and obedience and asking which of these is necessary, because the one assumes the other includes the third. But back to the immediate point. The psalmist is choosing to make companions of those who show their love and fear for God by their obedience to his word. And that is a very good and godly habit for the South African Christian. For believers who are in secular universities and colleges and working at corporations where they are surrounded by those who do not fear God, do you have good, godly companions that you may call your friends? with whom you socialize about spiritual things, sharpening one another as, as iron sharpens iron. I'm not saying there's no place for friendships with unbelievers. I'm not saying there's no room for intentional relationship building with the purpose of evangelism. I'm not saying we hide in holy huddles and let the world be damned. Of course not. Jesus pursued the lost. Jesus spent time with those who would be considered bad company. By all means, it would be wonderful to see in the lives of church members more outward thinking, more home-based evangelism that seeks the lost and doesn't just cling to the little favorite click. So, so by all means, let's, let's seek those who are outside of Christ. But the point here in its context is that he counts among his companions, his closest friends, those who truly fear God. And more than that, he considers anyone who truly fears God to be his companion because of that. Whatever their age, whatever their skin color, whatever their social standing, whatever their level of education, whatever their nationality, it doesn't matter if they're from a com culture completely foreign to him. It doesn't matter if they live in a country far away. The basis of his unity is not tied to class or color or ideological agreement. It is tied to their common faith in the Lord of Holy Scripture. So, so think about that if you have worldly crowds as your closest friends. Think about that if you are strangely uncomfortable around Christians who like to talk about the Lord and pray together and are excited for the things of God and you think this is just a bit strange, this is a little bit too much religion for my liking, I'm just going to take a step back. Think about that if you're prone to xenophobia or political extremism or racism of any flavor. With whom should you be most truly united and for what reason? What is the common thread of unity? Who should be counted among your companions really? Who should be very near and very dear to you? Someone who wears the same color political t-shirt? Someone that has the same amount of melanin in their skin? Someone who shops in the same category of shops that you do? No, should it not be this, someone who has the same reverential faith in Christ Jesus that you have. And think also about the effect that godless companions will have on you, about worldly people, how they will stir you to hate instead of love, how they will blind you to Scripture and instead of spur you in, on in it, how they will eat away at faithfulness and encourage small compromises, how they will distract you from spiritual responsibilities. Have you not seen this happen before? Be sure that you make companions of those who fear and love and know and obey the living God. And that takes us then to the last verse, which will just be the conclusion. And in a sense, it ties it all up. So I'm going to close with this. I will recognize the steadfast love of God in all the earth and towards his people. And I, and I say this is a good way to close because in South Africa, we are, we are so easily overcome by the, the litany of negatives that comes through the news. We, 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 we grumble constantly about all, all that's going on and and not because the things that we are grumbling about aren't real, but we, we, we just, we, we're easily overwhelmed by this dark picture of doom. But the psalmist looks at the whole earth, and he sees all of its riches, 
He sees all of its wonders. He sees all of its horrors. He sees all of its graces. He sees his own struggles and his own sins. He sees the collective whole, and his conclusion is this. The earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. Though the world has so much to offer with its sights and sounds and and tinsel and toys, your steadfast love is better than life. Though there is so much sorrow and suffering and crime, the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. A God of faithfulness and, of in, oh, and without injustice, good and upright is He. Though I have sinned and I still fall short, even as a Christian, I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. He sees the faithfulness of God in His creation towards His people still And if he sees that, we should see that too, even in a nation such as ours where there is so much to pray for and weep over. And in seeing this and in awe of this, he understands that this is something worth exploring further. So he says, teach me your statutes because they are marvelous. And they lead him to the invaluable God. These are godly habits for the South African Christian. And I say again, sow a thought and you reap an action. Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. Make sure you are sowing the right things. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this, your word. We thank you for the way it speaks to us in our circumstances so often and we pray that you would now give us the grace as we approach the communion table to humble ourselves before it and before you and to reflect upon its truths to confess our sins and to re- make resolutions of repentance that will not be empty words but that would know the energizing the power of your holy spirit and please father if there be any here who will be tempted to say tomorrow instead of today Uh, that you would again, even now, before they depart, you would prick their conscience with the knowledge that you are worthy of their praise and that you are their God and their judge and you are the one who offers salvation in the name of your Son. So be with us now, we pray, as we continue in an attitude of worship. Amen.